Roll. Jeff well, Christopher. We, we got to get the martini. Very good to meet you, my friend. Yeah, I'm I'm to Tony. Oh, Most definitely. Club. You know it. Yeah, that's yeah, Trevigny like, table side. Exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're going for us. Um, I actually thought it was kind of interesting that uh, that the original Hourglass Estate produced such a, a thoroughbred, like a pure, pure, pure Cabernet thoroughbred. And the very next thing you wanted to do when you got a new parcel and, and a new toy to play with was, let's get the rest of the kids involved in this game. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and yet I'm watching you bottle them individually. Yeah. Uh, that was not that wasn't the original plan though. The original the, we really thought that the that we were, well when we bought the Blue Line Vineyard. It had Cab Franc, Merlot, and Cab plant planted on it, and we thought that we were going to do a single wine from that property that sure. was going to be a blend of all three of those wines. And when we made the first wines in 2006, we really liked the, the expressiveness of each one of the varietal characteristics. They were really interesting, really cool, and they really stood apart. And we thought, you know what, we may actually be better off. Uh, releasing these wines as individual varietal wines, and so that's what we ended. Well, that's what we eventually did. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, um, you know, you get a site like that. Are you making wines that I'm drinking today, or are you are you making wines that you know? Do you, do you already have to do the um, the sort of the introduction to every wine? Going, okay, this is the 2011, but you know, you're going to need to decant it for this many hours or age it for. Is there sort of um, vintage by vintage perception of where the longevity of wine comes from? Or are we getting to the point where that's really not even a question we start to ask seriously anymore? We're thinking more about the, the what is it doing out of the gates? I think it's a valid question. I think that you should ask the question of where is um, – well, the question really is a stylistic question, and you need to ask yourself that question. What do I like to drink? Right. Do I like to drink more fruit-driven, more fresh, bright, vibrant – Explosive wines, or do I like to drink wines that? I'm gonna have, grab some Merlot or Chenin. Yeah, that's right. Or do I like to drink wines that are um, more subtle, uh -huh. uh, maybe a little bit less fruit driven, maybe a little bit more tertiary sure. and aromatic profiles. Um, so the first question I think is really one of the consumer, and then you need to ask the producer, can you deliver in those different styles? So. I can speak to the Hourglass Estate relative to its aging and what happens with it more than I can to Blue Line because sure. Blue Line is a, a newer project for us and, and we'll make some maybe some educated guesses relative to Blue Line. But the Hourglass Estate wine um, has about a seven or eight year arc to it uh, from its vintage date. And what we, what we tend to see at about year seven is the tertiary characteristics um, of the aromatic profile changes quite a bit, and all of a sudden you start getting more cigar, cedar, almost some Bordeaux-like characteristics. And the wine will uh, kind of shed the baby fat a okay. little bit, and so it's very fruit-driven and very fleshy, um, and much more explosive and dynamic um, from a fruit saturation standpoint in its earlier age. But when you get to year seven, you start, you start shedding the baby fat on the edges, and the core kind of tightens up and softens out a little bit, and it becomes more elegant. Um, it's got a long sort of arcing trajectory on your palate. Um, so you're saying drinking your wine becomes part of uh, an integral weight loss program? Well, I haven't found that to be the case, clearly, but <laughs> I'm figuring out how you to hear that, the folks? baby fat. <laughs> a bottle a day, that's all we ask, man, you know? But, uh, <laughs> look, at, look at all of our three cuisines. <laughs> all of us are really in shape. It's not the wine, right? it's everything that goes with the wine. You know? It's a different kind of shape you got to be in in the wine yeah, business, yeah, man, yeah. you know? All the way to that egg shape. I mean, it's really shape like an egg. That's all Um so in your own personal drinking, when you're when you're pulling your own wines out, are you drinking them young? Or are you are you? Depends on my mood. Sure. At the end of the day, and I've I've learned this over time to listen to my mood. And I like I like wines from all over the world. And I like wines that have different profiles. Sometimes I will want more mm. kind of searing acidity and crispness and and brightness. Other times I'll want something that's a little bit more brooding. Sometimes I want more fruit drivenness. Sometimes I want more aged. And those sort of interesting um, tertiary aromatic characteristics. Um, so it really depends on my mood, and I think that I think that people out there should pay more attention to what their mood is before they crack a bottle of them. Yeah, I think we started matching, you know, sort of wine to mood rather than, you know, food and wine. I, I always remember Paul Bocuse, the great French chef, once said, after three glasses, it all just sends to work, man, you know? <laughs> it's, 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 it's so true. I mean, drink what you like with what you want to eat. I mean, you. You know, it sounds, yeah, there are those epiphanies of food and wine matching. 
But overall, I mean, drink what you want to drink, eat what you want to eat. It always seems to work because you're making yourself happy. Is there a know? difference? Is there such a thing as a food wine and a, a sort of a wine that stands alone that won't really play well with much food? It, it just kind of <laughs> dominates whatever it comes into contact well, There are with. certain wines that are, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, a young young Nebbiolo, I think, would be a really tough thing to pair with. You know, that's why it goes well with pasta dishes and so forth. It needs to age a while. That doesn't want to really play well with others. And young Cabernet is very tannic, you know, other than maybe some, some, some big piece of steak with yeah. that. But other than that, I think, you can always find something. I mean, of course, you know, artichokes are tough, tough. You know, right. Asparagus <laughs> are tough. But for the most part, I think that we um, really, you know, you drink what you want to drink, eat what you want to eat for the most part. I mean, I know people who drink Cabernet with fish. Does it work for me? Maybe not all the time, but sometimes it does, you know, especially a big steaky fish, you know. What's, yeah. what's the overall production between Hourglass and, and Blue Line in terms of case production? What are you, what are you kind of averaging? Where are you hovering? The Hourglass estate is... Um, been pretty static since we since we began the project. So it's vintage specific, but it'll range between 600 and 800. Okay. Cases, top end. Gotcha. Uh, the blue line. Um, Hi guys. Hi John and Stacy. Real hey guys, Jeff, I don't mean to How come we have a person who lives in Boston and then a Boston Red Sox hat? Thank yeah. you. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't gonna go like there this. right away. Yeah, I saw it right away. Surrounded yeah, by yeah, you guys, yeah, exactly. man. <laughs> we have, we have some, uh, red Boston Sox. love here. You, you, exactly. you can't see that. Boston can't you? strong. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, so I I grew up here. Uh, so you're wondering what the hell are you doing as a Red Sox fan? But in the yeah. mid mid seventies. Um, I was an A's fan at that time, and Charlie Finley traded all of my favorite players to the Boston Red Sox. And I said, screw you, I'm going to become a Red Sox fan. So, <laughs> there you go. I've been part of the nation ever since. <laughs> nice, nice. That was a good game yesterday. That was great. So James, James, I mean, you know, James, you're up on here. I don't know how this whole system works, but, I mean, have you been, you've had hourglass wines in the past, haven't you? Sure. Yeah, yeah, you actually had him at the, you were at the Nantucket Wine Festival this year. You probably yeah. had him there. You met, you met Audra as well, if I'm not mistaken. Or he's I did. Cool, yeah. So I know you're familiar with the wines. And, you know, Jay, you know I don't know if, how this works if everybody sees James. James and I are good friends yep. from way back. So, nice. you know, and so we're good friends. And so I'm th I thank him for tuning in and talking about wines. But again, I think back to what you're saying yeah. about balance. I mean, in the end, I think the best wines that age the best are balanced. They taste great young, they taste great old. Everybody thinks the wine has to be tannic to age, and it's actually actually the exact opposite of that. The more tannin you have up front, all the fat and the density will, will melt away long before the tannin goes away, and the wine will just be tannic and hard 20 years from now. Did you hear that, Randy Dunn? <laughs> <laughs> I, I already know he's not watching. I don't have to worry. Yeah, he's, he's a friend of mine, so I didn't say that. Randy, I didn't say that. Uh, you didn't hear me say that. But, I mean, the only one that seems to do better with time is Nebbiolo. Right. Barolo. So, sure. I, you know, again, it's, it's a magic grape. It's like it has the color of Pinot and the tannin of the hardest Cabernet, so right. I can't figure it out. So. Right. Um, a blue line production hovering. Blue line production depends on the on the varietal that the um, the Merlot and the Cabernet are kind of the drivers of the portfolio, and they'll be anywhere from 900 cases to 1,200 cases okay. in that range. The Cab Franc, uh, which is really quite a gem, and and um, if you guys haven't tried the Cab Franc uh, and your Cab Franc fans, you might want to check it out. We make a very small amount of it. It's about 125 to 150 cases nice. a year. But I always give Jeff a hard time. There's no one says they're a Cabernet Franc fan. Nobody says that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I know, I know. I'm teasing you, Stacey. I'm teasing you. I'm giving a hard time. Um, We're no, we, yeah, we, you, I you think we may I have actually, earned you yeah, this year. Yeah, you we may have. So. So when, when uh, okay, so so when here's a cute little story. When uh, when we bought the Blue Line Ranch, Bob Foley was our winemaker at the time, and um, and Bob had been making the Cab Franc up at Pride for a number of years, and it was always one of my favorite wines that he would make. And so when we bought the ranch, we've got we've got three acres of Cab Franc planted there, and I called Bob and I said, I'm so excited. We've got we've got Cab Franc on on the property, and um, and he goes. Oh yeah, let me um, let me tell you from a winemaker's perspective how I, I kind of like to treat Cab Franc. He said, you know, if you um, if you take Cab Franc and you blend a little Cabernet Sauvignon in, it gets a little bit better. If you blend a little bit more in, even better, up to 100%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, wait a minute. I'm, not, I'm a little slow on the a, math here. Another friend of mine told me once how to make Cabernet Franc is you wait till the leaves fall off and you pick it two weeks later. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things. But, you know, 
back to Franck is I think it grows really well on the eastern sides of Napa Valley. It gets a little warmer. It's you know we say you go through from the three bean salad because Cabernet Franc can be very herbal, very green. You know, pyrazine for you geeks yeah, out there yeah, in the back exactly. row. Yeah, and you know who you are, man. <laughs> so Cabernet, you know, the the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon is Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. And you can see both aspects in Cabernet of those parentings. So yeah. the parents, I should say. So Cabernet Franc goes from almost three bean salad to a very pretty underbrushy sort of rosemary. You go from Loire Valley almost to Saint Emilion style Cabernet Franc, but it is a very aromatic grape, and I've sort of fallen in love with it now because I've been forced to. Um, it's a forced, it's an arranged <laughs> marriage, I guess Jeff would say. And so, shotgun wedding. So it's a shotgun wedding, but I love it now, and you know, and, and I'm even thinking about working with it on my own, my own line as well. So you know, he turned me. So Tony, let me ask you a question. Um, in, in sometimes when we make Cap Franc, we will get these coffee-like. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, aromatics and so forth. And um, I, I don't think that they're a function of the barrel programs because uh, you often smell them before they've gone through any barrel aging. Um, and whereas uh, whereas the camera. whereas Cab, um, Cab Franc often has a lot of pyrazine, which will give the, the green uh, notes, the bell pepper and so forth. But do you, do you happen to know if if there is a chemical compound in Cab Franc that is also found in coffee, and if that's where that well, coffee it's still character comes from. It's still, it's still pyrazine. It's still spiciness. You still get that sort of green, because you get it in bell pepper, too. It's very green, so very maybe you spicy. Maybe you get pyrazine in coffee as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely, because ah, it's green okay. beans. Right. I mean, it's, it's un- it. Basically, when you get it in got coffee, it's, it's, it's a bean that's green, and they roast it, and they really roast it. They might miss the roast. It might be a little light roast, like a light roast. Versus a French roast is almost oily. It's pulled the oil out of the skin. That's it's cool. almost a light roast. And, you know, some of these, now everybody knows there's all these superstar coffee roasters all over the country. You know, you have, you know, Blue Bottle, right. Psych Glass. And some of these guys do really light roast and you can almost taste that green. It's almost a spiciness. It's well, almost James, are, are you, are you kind of catching on? To, is this something that you're, you kind of nod your head as we're talking about this? Would you say that you're, you're kind of hip to this whole family of bell pepper that you pick up sometimes in Cab Franc, or are you more likely to find it in things like Sauvignon Blanc, or have you experienced, I guess I should say, what we're talking about? No, I mean, I'm nodding my head just, uh, you know. Trying to stay awake? The show's not really fascinating to hear the... Uh, <laughs> He's got tribe the science that goes that goes That's behind winemaking. <laughs> so James actually, you know, James worked with me one year. He's an intern with me up at Neil Family Vineyards way nice. back when. So he knows he knows wine. He's not letting on very easily, but he's letting <laughs> he knows wine very well. So no, I just uh, remember following Tony around with his winemaker buddies with a with a thief doing wine tastings, and then they're swirling it and they're coming up with words to describe wine I couldn't even think of. So I'm drinking the wine, trying to trying to taste the same flavors and finally they all stop and they say, James, you know, after we drink, we pour the wine down this gutter here. You don't have to drink it all. Meanwhile, I was chugging it. And then I had to drive yeah. back home to San Francisco. Exactly. <laughs> so. and the, um, let me ask you this. Let's say you're reading a periodical and you come across a descriptor of wine. Does that descriptor drive you to want to drink that wine? Or are you driven more by the personalities or, or maybe the, the winery itself and a track record of, uh, of sort of faith you've had in drinking the wines in the past? Uh, I would say the second part, the uh, more the behavior. And I'm always intrigued by the stories behind the label, kind of like what went into it. Is it a single vineyard? Is it, you know, 100% that varietal or not? And then more the flavor profile. But that's just my preference. Sure. I just think it's uh, sometimes disillusioning for the wine drinker. I mean, maybe we take this for granted, our culture, right? We, it's tongue in cheek when we read a periodical sometimes because we're reading it and we're like, okay, I know that guy, I know that guy, I went to dinner with that guy, I know that vineyard, I know exactly where that's coming from. Yeah. And so sometimes the descriptors are taken maybe with a little grain of salt. And yet I think when you're not embedded in the culture the way we are, and sometimes that descriptor is your gateway to that wine. So I'm always fascinated when I read these things on the back of the bottle. Uh, the tasting notes. Yeah, is this a fun or a painful process for you to put on the bottle? Uh, tasting notes. You know, it, I'll tell you what's interesting about tasting notes is it after you have a long period of time uh, with a particular vineyard that has pretty similar characteristics year in and year out, making the tasting notes interesting and not just 
you know, cutting and pasting from last year. <laughs> that becomes you know who you are out there in the wine business. We've all seen it, man. You know, <laughs> wait a minute, that looks like last year. Each year, in each year is a little bit different, so you have to you have to kind of drill down and pull out those things that are common, so that people can understand what the thread is of the wine, and then you have to be able to pull out the vintage specific things and wind that together. And uh, you know, I think some people take more pleasure in, sure. in writing those than others, and. I, on a on a good day, I really love it. On a you know stress day, it's sometimes you know not the easiest thing to do, and it's it's a creative process. The old joke was it was hard to write them here; it gets easier here. By about here, you get exactly. super creative. Exactly. And uh, yeah. Tony, how about you? How about tasting notes? What um, you know, I, in my in my previous job, I mean, Jeff does most of them here. I help him out. Um, my previous one, I wrote all the tasting notes. So, um, again, I think it's a I think it's more about if you're dealing with a single vineyard, it's the similarity should be similar every year. Anyway, the vineyard should right. be the same every year. The nuance should be a little different. Um, it's it's really you're telling the, the consumer the vintage. What what happened in the vineyard? What differences do we make? You know how did we um, you know do we use different oak? Do we did the fruit come in you know light or heavy? So the reality of it is, um, you know, you look at these tasting notes and you sort of give the person a snapshot or a postcard of the vintage. When you know, and I've been really dealing with single vineyard wine basically from my previous job into now and. I think the most in, most enjoyable wines to make because you really are subject to the vintage, and I think that's what I'm trying to tell you what the vintage is done. So, Can I ask a question? coming in, yeah, what you got? I mean, um, given that it's a single vineyard, um, do you find yourself experimenting with different yeasts and things like that, and, and changing out the yeah. oak more frequently? Because the grapes are, for all intent and purposes, barring weather, going to be somewhat consistent. They'll age, the vines will age, but how often do you experiment with different yeasts? Um, we use, you know, again, I think uh, as a great winemaker, one of my mentors told me here, that our biggest goal of yeast is get the wine dry, you know, and, and the nuance of, of the fruit itself is more important than the nuance of the yeast because any nuance the yeast is going to give the wine will be lost with 18 to 20 months of barrel age. Um, get the wine dry. So I'm really selecting yeasts that will get the wine dry and I can really then focus on you know, the wine crafting itself. I mean, once the wine is fermented, it's basically done. You age it for 18 to 20 months. And I really don't want to touch the wine any other time other than maybe adding a little bit of sulfur to keep the wine going to bottling. Um, I think you're in the sense of your concept of the vineyard's very different year in, year out. This is a very tannic vintage. 13 is a very tannic, but very color laden vintage. If you can maintain the tannin and get all that color, you're going to make magnificent wine. Some of the best wines ever made off the property. And we think we've crafted that. We think we came up with a concept this year on how to ferment these wines to get what we need. Whereas 11, 11 was not 12. It's the same piece of property. But I think anybody who visited here in 2011, anybody who lives here would say 11 is not 2013. I mean, I'm in a pair of shorts underneath this table. You can't see it right now. And I'll probably be in a pair of shorts all the way to December. In 11, we got four inches of rain in seven days. So really, you attack the vineyard completely differently. You're looking at different oak. You're looking at different. We did things in eleven that you'll never do again. But we made great wines, and sure, sure. I, I, you know, so I, just because it's a single piece of property, I mean, we have all five Bordeaux varietals. So in a given vintage, like this vintage, Malbec is off the charts good. Maybe it's going to make itself. You know, it, it's the same concept in Bordeaux. The best vintages of Bordeaux have Petit Bordeaux in it, but they can't ripen it every vintage. So um, even like this vintage, Malbec is fantastic. Our wines will probably have a little more Malbec in it. You know, we were talking at the beginning of this that we're 100%. We're no longer that. We blend now. And Jeff and I just said we wanted to create more layers, more nuance, and just more aha moments within the wine rather than just a one-trick pony. This is Cabernet. But, boy, do I get Malbec. You know, Malbec can be very plummy, very just sort of – Jeff likes to call it watermelony and zingy. Um, those aren't my descriptors, but <laughs> – it works for him, and I get what he means. It's um, like an elegant funnel. Petit I'm, I'm the guy with the non-winemaker <laughs> descriptors. Petit Verneau is very, you know, Cabernet Franc is very aromatic. Merlot is very unctuous. Some people say that the Cap Merlot is almost like the fat on the skeleton. So you have all these different aspects, but every year it's different. Last year Merlot wasn't as good as 13. So that's how the blends are put together. And 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 really, as a single vineyard wine, now our glass estate is completely different. We have one clone. We have one rootstock, it's one wine, and, and it's pretty pretty different than, than our Blue Line. But Blue Line, to me, is, is, is really the, the, the complete deal. We want to welcome uh, Kimberly. Welcome to the show. Uh, Kimberly, uh, uh, are you familiar with the, uh, the Hourglass and the Blue Line wines? Oh, yes, very much so. I love oh. them. 
Oh, she's she's, she's here to torment us. Nice. Oh. We're all about torment, man. I what really wish I could be there virtually, but I'm going to Piedmont in a few uh, days, and I couldn't get up there before. Oh, that white I'm truffle. going to Piedmont. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 got to be there for yeah, Nebbiola really, Harvest and White Truffles. That's, 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 that's called a humble brag. <laughs> that's a, such a humble brag. Oh, I wish I was there, but I'm going, I'm going to Piedmont. Yeah, it's <laughs> 17 I'll bring back later. some truffles for Jeff to cook. White truffles. Oh, white truffles. Oh, oh, so, you're man. forgiven. Oh, those are the type of vintage where we all could, because it's an early vintage in Napa. We're almost all done in the valley. You know, people are still picking up, but we can, a lot of us can get to Burgundy for Haas Beast or something like that this year. We can finally make it, so pretty excited. Probably not going to go, though, but I mean, the idea sounds grand. Uh, yeah. Let's talk real quick. Looking at your production and all that, how do you get the word out as a small winery in these days with literally the quality shelf is packed to the gills? I mean, the, the nature of yeah. single vineyard wine has just gone off the charts. As a wine drinker, it's the greatest time to be alive and be a wine drinker out there. My goodness, quality, price, availability out there is pretty amazing. How do you find a niche? Like, I mean, I love the fact that we can do this, and, and there's always room at the table for another great quality you know, wine. James you know? is, you know, James is, a, is, is an East Coast consumer, and I've known him a long time, but I think his answer at the beginning was, you know, he identifies with personalities. Yeah. Like, you know, first and foremost, I think, James, you would agree it's quality, right? Then after that, you identify with the people that who are making it, and, and really that's somehow how it registers with you. It reality is, isn't it back to the 70s that you know you find a winery you love, you go to a wine store, you find a wine buyer that you can trust, and 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 you know you you like his ideas. He turns you onto a wine. You get to Napa Valley, you meet the cake breads, you meet the Chapelets of the 70s, you meet that. Now more than ever, it's that way. And and yeah. yes, the market's bigger, but I think the personalities are still driving the business. And yeah. you meet Jeff, you sit down with him, you listen to his passion for 10 minutes. You'll buy hourglass. Yeah. And the wine's good. We're a state driven product. That's almost secondary to Jeff. You know, that's almost a given. It has to be there, but it's personality after that. Yeah, and I, I think that there there are a number of interesting trends that are going on right now. Um, you know, yes, there's a proliferation of brands. There's a lot more to choose from and so forth. But also, wine consumption in this country has gone has gone up uh, really quite dramatically. I, I was just reading. It Thank God for that. I mean, I've done my part. I don't know about you. Yeah, but. I mean, per capita consumption is up, and, and also total number of people drinking wine is up. And and uh, this year was the first year, I believe, that we uh, we matched beer consumption in the United States, which is a big, big number. I think it was 371 million cases of wine sold this year. So that's a, that is that's that's you know the whole pie is growing at the same time as a lot of these little brands are, are proliferating and so forth. So it's a really good time to be in the wine business. And I, I think that Tony's right. I think that um, these are these are little projects of passion and. You know, we we put a lot of time and energy, and it's a lot of um, you know the the people that are behind the brands um, who have interesting stories to tell and are in, really engaged in what they're doing on a day in and day out basis. That's that's a fun and interesting thing, and so that resonates with people. And we just have to find vehicles to tell the stories and and um, and be able to get out and present. So if you're engaged with the marketplace, you know you're probably selling wine. And you're building your brand and doing what you need to do. So you get your ball rolling with a guy like Foley, who, you know, kind of sets a, a mark out there. And, and certainly your wines hit right when his sort of star was on its ascension. Yep. And uh, um, how, Tony, how do you walk into a pair of shoes where you've got a track record, you know, track record of success? Sometimes as a winemaker, you walk in going, I got the flowing cape. I can save this whole operation and bring yeah. great wine to the world, no, baby, you know? It's funny, you know? Then you it, walk into some operations, you're like, oh, man, not, that bar's kind of high already <laughs> here, man. It's not, it's not the first time I've done it. Right. You know, I was at Plump Jack for nine years. I was a winemaker. I took over for Nils Vengi, the first American winemaker to get 100 points. Right. So I've done this before. You know, I've walked into the legend's shoes, and I'm not afraid of that. You right. know, Bob's a great winemaker. He helped mold who I am. I mean, I tasted all of his wines. I wanted to get better and better and better. So, you know, I know his wines, but, you know, in the same instance, I'm not afraid of that. You know, my wines will be different than Bob's. Yeah. I've had the same level of success as Bob. I mean, he's been doing it longer, but if you look at the scores, they're the same. I mean, the but, scores. Yeah, you know, everybody talks about it, but yet Bob and I are both passionate. Right. We made wines right next to each other at one point. So I know how passionate he is, and then I had the utmost respect. I mean, like Jeff will say, and I agree with him, there's three winemakers that I consider that are that are people that drove my, my, my age group of winemakers. It's Bob Foley, Helen Turley. And basically, Bob Levy. Bob Levy yeah. But I mean, I, you can also yeah. say Dave Ramey too. You could sure. say Dave Ramey or Paul Hobbs in there too. But Helen Turley, no argument. You know, Bob Foley, no argument. And I think Bob Levy, with the success he's had with Harlan and what he was doing up there with sorting tables before anybody else even knew what a sorting table was. 
Um, I mean, he really drove drove where the business is. So those three guys, to me, are legends in the business. And, and, so. and I think that one thing that attracted me to Tony, there are many things that attracted me to Tony along the way. And, and when you come to the decision that you need to have boots on the ground day in and day out, um, rather than consulting one maker, uh, it's it's a you know it's a for us it was a really really big very serious decision that we had to make, and there are not a lot of people that can slot in and, right. just, and just take over for a guy who has. You know, I look at Bob Foley as one of the transcendent winemakers of our generation. I mean, he he and the and the and the group that Tony just mentioned changed the mold in Napa Valley. They cracked it, they broke it down, and they took wine in a totally different direction. So that's a that's a really cool thing. So to put it in parlays, they came up with a guitar riff that everybody copied from that day yeah, forward. You know, and, and, and in many respects, they were the they were the you know the Ray Dave or the Dave Davies, you know, <laughs> right. breaking his amp apart and and clipping. Um, uh, clips on it and distorting it and creating that sound and then all of a sudden everybody goes, ah, cool, I gotta do that. <laughs> but, um, but I think what's important relative to bringing Tony on is that Tony brings his own passion, his own expertise and uh, a whole bunch of really refined and um, very profound techniques. But he's also a student of the game. And so he, he has studied the history of winemaking in Napa Valley. He knows who the old masters are, he's learned their styles, he's adopted and incorporated elements of those, and then he's put his own overlay on top of that, which is quite unusual. And this is one of the things that when Tony and I sat down and we said, okay, what do we want to do with the glass and how do we want to, to wind this together? Um, I, looked at, I looked at that and I said, here's a guy who really gets it. He gets where Napa has come from. He gets where Napa is going to. And really, I think the future of Napa is we're seeing a, a pendulum swing right now, and there's there's a whole sweep of styles that Napa is capable of. And so if you look back at um, winemaking of the 70s and 80s, it's going to be a little bit more old school. It's going to be a little bit more European in its thought process. It's going to be more uh, picking a little bit earlier, a little bit more on the red fruit side of the spectrum, a little bit higher acids, a little shorter tannins. And then you, you have Bob Foley and the whole crew of winemakers that... Um, defined the early 90s, and that pendulum yeah. started to swing out, and and the ripening envelope started to get pushed out, and so mouthfeel started to change. The density of color going from the red fruit side to the black fruit side of the spectrum, pHs rose, and acidities fell down, and and alcohols um, came up a little bit. Just and, a hair. Well, yeah, I mean, um, there's still and, wines in the '70s that are alcohols over 15s. There's yeah, Schaefer yeah, 78, I mean, and, which is a legendary wine, is 14. You go, and I mean, you go back to Bordeaux, you could do some alcohol Bordeaux tests of the, you know, the great good. Bordeaux vintages, and they're going to be a hell of a lot higher than than what they say on the on the label. Yeah. So the alcohol thing is is just a let's we could go for hours. Yeah, on that no kidding. Well, so anyway, that that stylistic spe spectrum comes out this way, and so now you've got Napa, which has this pretty wide range from more traditional to more modern in style, and we rode that spectrum pretty far out. And when Tony and I sat down and talked about it, we said, you know what, where where is the holy grail for us in terms of how we want to represent ourselves in Napa? And it's going to be a little bit right, of, a little bit right of center. Kimberly, Kimberly hold on, come on, it's Jeff. Here. Hold on, Kimberly. It's Jeff talking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know better. You know better than anybody. Come on, Kimberly. What you got? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're gonna that's it. Yeah, there you go. She just knows. Throw it in there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Good. I just no. I was just wondering about you know all the great '60s and '70s wines that we've been holding on to and opening and still enjoying. Do you think that we the uh, the We've jumped the shark with respect to, you know, still appreciating the wines with this new style, Jeff, or this retroactive style that's coming back. Do you think people are going to continue to hold on to wines? I mean, not continue, but start holding on to wines like they did and drink them in 20 and 30 years? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think the wines will stand up. And I think you will be. I think the misnomer is that these wines won't age. And I think that's nonsense. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, question is, how do you know? Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, you don't know. I mean, again, it's it's balance. When the, there's one word anyway, can take them. It's balance. If the wine tastes good young, it's going to taste good old. We know that. Um, you know, the, the 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 color and the tannin has to be in balance. The tannins too high. These wines are going to be skeleton. 
shell since it's 1528. I would say our generation kind of di- like dissolved that entire concept that wines get better with age. They get different, different with, with age. age. That, that's, yeah. a, that's a really But good, we kind yeah, of walked really away from that, that sort of illusion that there's something I mean, magical that happens in that cellar. Well, better, you know, again, Jeff and I always get, get stuff why we get along so well. I always say, Jeff, it's not better, it's different. Thank you. Different is not better, different is different. And, you know, sometimes it is better, sometimes it's not, it's just different, you know, and um, the Plus, seven- this is California, right? We're never going to sell you a case of wine and tell you not to drink it. Right. Well, <laughs> well and I think to answer, I think to answer Kimberly's question, um, we are a culture of immediacy, and so we tend to get our wines, pull a cork, drink them. And I, I think we have quite a few collectors of Hourglass who probably have drunk most of their allocations along the way. And we'll never experience them unless they go on Wine Searcher and, and find older vintages and so forth. Probably won't um, probably won't get a chance to to taste some of those older vintages, which are actually showing incredibly. So the wines will age. The question is, do you have the patience to age? And and that's a consumer issue. Um, and you know that's that's each individual will have to have to uh, make their make their own minds on that. So and we'll have to be we'll have to exhibit some patience. I think Kimberly <laughs> and I don't mean to keep talking to you straight, Kimberly, but you know the business. You're in the business. How what what is it? What what is the stat? How you know how quickly is a bottle per drank within the time it's purchased? Yeah, between 20 minutes and three hours of purchase. Wow, that's, that's any price. 70 percent of wine. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I mean, so you know, we all have our wines represented in the best restaurants of the United States, and you know, there's no there's no programs that I know of except for a few restaurants that even are doing aged in their cellars. They're selling the next vintage yeah. and they work on. That doesn't mean that we cowtow to that. In the same instance, you know, balance is our goal. I want the wine to taste great on the wine list, maybe with a decant. And I want the wine to taste so great and somebody's selling 20 years, but it's balanced we're shooting for. We're not shooting for forward fruit and opulence. And then, you know, but some, you know we're California. You know, we, everybody wants us to make Bordeaux or Burgundy here in California. We have the Pacific Ocean 20 miles behind us. You know, you guys are looking at us right here. Behind us is the Pacific Ocean. You know, the Bordeaux and Burgundy has the Atlantic Ocean. Very different oceans and very different during harvest season. I mean, Bordeaux gets almost 20 inches or 12. Well, all the great wines have that in common, which yeah. is options. As a yeah. wine drinker, if a wine is balanced, I can have the, the, the forward fruit in its right. youth and enjoy the balance of that forward fruit. Or I can cellar it for 10 or 20 Heck, years and the wine will France still has, perform. France has that whole option. You can actually have enough. You can have Burgundy. You can have Bordeaux. It's all. It's in one country. So, I mean. They have it as well, so why can't we have it in yeah. California? You know, no, you, have, you have different different camps. So, but, but I think I think that it for really great vineyard sites with really great attention to detail in terms of winemaking, you sort of can have your cake and eat it too. I think that I think these wines um, show beautifully as young wines, but they will change and evolve and and age actually quite beautifully over time. So, again, you kind of as a consumer, you sort of have to ask yourself, what do I like and I, I tend to drink based on my mood. So if I want explosive fruit forwardness, then I'm going to drink a younger wine. And if I want something that I might ponder a little bit more or might have more exotic aromatics, then I'm probably going to go with an older wine. And I got a quick these question. Wines uh, do both. Let's throw out for, for James and for Kimberly both. How much wine do you both keep at your house right now? What would you say, bottle case wise, what would you say you keep for a, a personal option collection of wine? Ten for me, ten cases. Ten cases. So you have 120 or so bottles. Quick math. You catch that? You see that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably around like that between there and 150. Cases or bottles? <laughs> 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 What's the address uh, there, James? We'll be over like yeah, my, my, drink, my, drink, wine, drink, my drink, wine storage yeah. is in a uh, subterranean mechanical closet that's, you know, concrete, stays around 60 degrees naturally. But uh it's not sexy. Are you like secretly one of those James Bond villains? Is it like a super psychotic wine yes, cellar with cameras, uh, motion detectors? Car. Like <laughs> some issues we need to go through, James, you know, later yeah, on a different show? Kind of, or? It's kind of funny now, though. You know, we all have to agree. You go on the auction sites now, and you can get older aged Bordeaux for the same price as current vintages. So yeah. it's almost behooves you to right. keep a cellar now. Yeah. I can go on and get a bottle of wine for you know my dinner on Saturday night. I want to have a great dinner and get a Magnum or something great, Lavalas cost. And it's less money than a current 750. 
Right. You know, and the great vintages cost money. Don't get me wrong. I mean, 82, you're not going to touch for very well. But I mean, there are good vintages, not great vintages that you can touch yeah. for less money than the 09 vintage. So it almost mm-hmm. behooves you to keep a seller other than some drinking stuff that you want to drink. You know, Pinot Noir, California is sure. the same way. Burgundy, well, come on. Burgundy is like baseball cards for adults. We all know that. It's like, hey, look, I got the Hannes Wagner. You know, I got, that's great. Awesome. You know, I mean, it's, it's, Burgundy is just, it's just kids, filthy. Kids at home, don't fall in love with Burgundy. Yeah. It's the road to ruin. It's hey, torture, you know, man. It, don't fall it for is, it. it, it <laughs> but it will, it'll get all of you sooner or later. You know, An so. in-studio question. So, yes. Yeah, I'm a rich reader. And I, was hey, rich. Kids, I was wondering, why is it that you want to put away Burgundy if... The cur- if the, you can purchase aged Burgundy in brokers. Burgundy, you can't anymore. I mean, yeah. depending on what you want. Burgundy is like baseball cards. I mean, yeah. you know, the longer you keep it in your cellar, the more it's valuable, no matter how good or bad it is. Regardless, so that board it's, better board board spe- thing. it's better when it was kept in your cellar than it was kept in the broker cellar. Yeah. I mean, well, the broker, well, the, either way, you can buy older Burgundy, but if you bought it at $200, it's now $4,000. You know, I have buddy collectors who bought Henri Jaillet in the mid, you know, the mid early 2000s and the 2000s. The wine's gone up 10, 12 times, you know. Why do you think Providence is so important at auctions? Yeah, I want exactly. to know the lineage of where this was stored, the, the yeah, seller well, I want photographed. Well, that and you, you, get, you get the capital appreciation, not the broker. Right. right. So, but if you're buying Burgundy, sure, you buy it through a broker. But for, for a collector like us, I mean, I'm not going to pay $5,000 for a bottle of, you know, Rousseau, you know, Rousseau, you know, Cloche and Jock or, or something to that effect. I mean, I just can't afford it. Or Jaye, you know. It's I mean, the question of the night. How many cases do you keep at the house? Yeah. Oh, me, about five. About five. Excellent. Yeah. So you drink what you buy pretty rapidly. You, you, you keep it for extended I, amounts of time? I, I probably drink. A, my household drinks a little bit less wine than... Your friends in Boston's house. <laughs> well, it's not a contest, but okay. <laughs> but it is a contest. Yeah, okay, that's not what's wine well, collecting. There is so. that part of the business. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, uh, for, for to follow up to this question with James and Kimberly, though, would you say you acquire most of your wine through your own private uh, acquisitions about tracking them down and going and finding the wine? Or are you uh, working with local retailers that you find are giving you enough dynamics to, to put the diversity in your cellar that you enjoy? Retailer, primarily. Retailer yeah. stuff. Yeah. And when, uh, Bruno Pratt's from Bordeaux once gave me a great piece of advice. He said, if you're in love with the vintage, he said, buy two cases, hold one, and then every year drink a bottle from the other case and watch how it's evolving, you know, and see where you want to gauge it. Do you want to wait another five years? Do you want to wait another 10 years? The rest of it. No, but it was a great piece of advice. That was it's paid off Absolutely. well. Especially the two case yeah. buy part of that. I like his style. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, that, that, and, and unfortunately, that would cost you, if I'm not mistaken, Bruno, is that Co? Co Cernel? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. So that's seventy two hundred dollars that you're gonna do. Yeah, there you go, man. That, that, that <laughs> so um, you know, and then I yeah, can give it, you that kind of pleasure for less. I can yeah, play that yeah, in two yeah, notes, yeah, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jeff can. We have these wines. Come on, no. So um, no, seriously. Price point on on our on, on the blue line. Uh, the blue line Merlot is uh, seventy five retail. Okay. The cab or, the cab Saab is one twenty five, and okay. the cab Franc is one thirty five. Okay, yeah. outstanding. Yeah. Pricing your Cabernet Franc higher than your Cabernet yeah. Sauvignon. Yeah. That is well, absolutely. Got, wait, 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 Jeff, you and I think it's underpriced. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's twenty three year old vines, and you know we all know we had phylloxera in the late late eighties, early nineties. So we were very lucky to get these vines on the ground, and right. it gave us this year one point. Eight tons to the acre. Wow! So yeah. I think we, we have wow. six whole barrels of it. You know, we're really cornering the market. And these are really, as a flight of wine, it's really interesting. They are so varietally correct, but they are very intense. The Cabernet Franc, there's almost a pure minerality that yes. that's in there. Like you can get the, the floral nature yeah. that Cabernet Franc wants to be. She's there, but there's a there's a pretty intense core there for, for general, Cabernet Franc and mineral. Yeah. I mean, that's how you all, would describe all of the uh, all of the blue line wines have a strong mineral core to yeah. them, which is really cool because. It adds some lift and energy in the back mid palate, and it and it probably helps volatize some of the aromatics. So you get these higher toned bands of aromas, and the, that's a function of these gravel bed soils. So this is all cobble and rock and sand and so forth, and and you can really taste the minerality in each one of them. Each one of the varietals will express that minerality a little differently, um, but the Cab Franc is the one where you really notice it the most. 
And, it's probably, um, and I think it's, you know, you would agree it's Estonia's corner. It is Estonia's. It is yeah. literally, it almost looks like Chateauneuf down in that yeah. little, that little bay. Like ankle, the ankle cold. breakers no, walking no, through no, the, no, we, uh, we call them catapult stones. Cause if you're back in the Roman times, you exactly would grab it a catapult to kill somebody, you know? <laughs> I mean, they would definitely go a long way. They're about this big, they're, they're solid rock. So. But what's super refreshing about these wines is there is not a footprint of winemaking, so to speak here. Now there's a, there's a talent for balance here, but I think the, the great winemakers, you speak to this more than anybody, is is at some point you step out of the equation. The vineyard starts to talk and has the loudest voice in that finished wine. The winemaking becomes this scaffold of preservation rather than I can manipulate this into something. It's how do I take that experience of me plucking that grape in the vineyard? How do I capture that in that glass of wine? Yep. And that's humble winemaking. I mean, that to me is where you're stepping out of it. And these are really a crossover of Bob and I because I right. inherited these wines halfway through it. But that's really, I think, you sort of nailed it on the head. You know, our, my goal is to get the wine to fermentation, get it into barrels, and call it a day. Yeah. Sounds funny, Jeff. You're paying for me a lot. But the point of the matter know, is that, to that. get it there is the hard part, yeah. you know, and to really capture the essence of Franc, Merlot, and Cabernet. You know, my previous client, I said, if all the wines taste the same on the table, I failed as a winemaker. Right. I want you to say Cabernet to say Cabernet. Like, Franc, well, that's Franc, and that's Merlot. That's my goal, and and we have you know it, I don't want to go to the secrets you know the man behind the curtain there's really none I mean you pick it at the right time you ferment sure. it at the right temperatures and get it the right barrels you call it a day um, I'll, I'll I'll personify that but yeah that's sort of how it sounds great oh yeah bring them on and and please more of those yeah, yeah. we have a lot of love boxers oh what was the question you can you can read the love notes later. All right. <laughs> year with Hourglass in relation to your years as in winemaking in Napa? You know, I was at Plump Jack for nine years, and it's a great place to work. I mean, Plump Jack, the ownership group, the, the, the management group is wonderful, but you get older. I started in Napa Valley when I was 22 years old, so I, I, I grew up, I worked at Duckhorn for six years, worked for a great company there, watched that company explode 400, 400 tons to 1,600 tons into what it is now. I took over Paradox for them at the beginning, and when I when I sat down and said I want to be sort of what do I want for the rest of my life because I'm 40 years old and you know you have these these crises I want to work for a family owned estate grown vineyard that was the first thing I want to have their own winery I don't want to have to work at a custom crush facility where you're writing work orders and you don't know if they're pumping over yeah, maybe they said they did I don't know they, you know when you watch them and they're looking at you like why are you looking at me because I'm telling you to do something um, I want to be able to do it myself I want to be able to do a lot of the work myself. And I want to have an owner that's in really engaged in the process. And, you know, Jeff and I had a lot of tastings. And, we, you know, we, 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 we belong to a sort of a guy's lunching group that drinks really crazy old wines. And, and Jeff and I just started talking about the past of California, the history of it. And, and he was sort of surprised by it. I knew so much. I was sort of surprised he knew so much. We both bonded on the fact that we like sugar as a band and Bob Mould. So we were like, that. and we both love music. And I can't play a lick of anything, and he can play guitar very well. So we bonded on that. Uh, other music than that, you know, I just I, then I, then he got me to Blue Line, and Hourglass Estate was sort of the baby for Jeff. And I actually made great wine from those grapes, the Hourglass Estate, because he sold some grapes to Duckhorn the first year, so I knew the vineyard. Yeah. And but Blue Line to me is the future of our brand. It is the most magical piece of property, one of the top five properties, I think, in Napa Valley. And I know this, not wow. be, I, I felt this. And when Rick Foreman, probably yeah, the original sorry. rock star winemaker in Napa Valley, goes to you and says, I've wanted to buy this property for 20 years. <laughs> and I finally couldn't get it. I bought my property where Foreman Winery is now. And I never looked back. But coming back here brings back all these memories because, you know, as Rick Foreman made the wines at, at, at Sterling in the early 70s. So you, we look at Sterling from Blue Line. And the then all the blue line. Yeah, Terry got across. together yeah, back in the oh, day, yeah. man. Just tearing up. <laughs> and then you had, you know, Bartarajo. I ran into Bartarajo from Araujo Vineyards at, at um, the, the Cal Sugar Farmers Market. And Bart and I went to high school together, not in the same era. He's a little bit older than I. But, um, you know, I went to Sarah High School in San Mateo. Played, he played baseball. I played baseball. So all of a sudden you have a brotherhood because we both played baseball there. And You spiked we're, him coming around second. No, he, 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 us, he, he, he was 60 at the time, so he couldn't get out of the way. <laughs> so it's amazing how that worked. But... You know, it's a very prestigious program, so you sort of wear it on your sleeve. And we, we talked a lot, and we sort of bonded over that. And he told me, point blank, I wanted to buy that property. I just couldn't get my mind around it at the time. And I would think now with him selling Araujo to the Latour group, 
that he's probably kicking himself that he doesn't own this property. That was we, news. we own a huge piece of property in Napa Valley, one of the most special, one-of-a-kind pieces of property in Napa Valley, and that's really what got me there. I mean, Jeff brought me up there. We tasted the wines, and being able to take over for someone like a steward like Bob Foley, it was great. I mean, I'm very lucky. I mean, he started the ball rolling, and I'm just going to try to – I always said he built the Mercedes-Benz. I'm just going to buff the paint job and put some new tires on. So, so as a winemaker, you walk in culturally so. like you're like, the equipment's the way I like, it's the pump I like, it's the basket well, press no, I, I mean, like. Equipment, equipment, equipment's different. I mean, come on. As an owner, oh, you're like, oh, God, you're like going to want to what? You know, it's like, come on, do you ever buy a house and like what they did to it before you? No. I mean, it's no. You know, the, the, the bathroom's awful. Why would you go with Red Wolf? I mean, I, you know, come on, you know, convection. You know, so, I mean, it's the same thing. It's awesome. So, five. Oh, we got a five in there. She's yelling at us. <laughs> what, does that, what does that mean? Five? Oh, five minutes. Okay, good. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I'm going to fire this one at you. Okay, we're looking at the 2011. We're crossing over from a previous winemaker leaving you the spice rack full of options in the cellar. Mm -hmm. You come in and do a final blend, which to me is A, challenging, B, interesting as a winemaker. I get to take components I was not part of, and yet I can evaluate, mm -hmm. taste them, and go, how would I bring these together? Um, as a winemaker, from the ego standpoint, is it is there more of a rush bringing a great vintage like 11 to market with a magical wine, or is it like a 2012 where all you can do is screw it up? I mean, what's the what's the? I can make a 100 point wine in 2012, but that 95 pointer I made in 2011 felt like such a better achievement, you know? I think in winemaking, and we're all in this room. I think everybody who's here who's been around this business long enough will hear most winemakers talk and say. My favorite vintages, and this I can talk about Plump Jack especially, are not the vintages that got the best scores. Right. They were the vintages where maybe something happened. You know, wine is such a connection to your life. For sure. You know, and especially as a winemaker, I mean, I, I associate vintages with, with steps in my life, both good and bad, and how those vintages came to be. And and so there are some great aspects. I mean, to me, I loved, you know, and I don't, I'm sorry, Donna, to take it away from Hourglass a little bit, Careful. but 06 Plump Jack to me was a great vintage. I love the 06 Reserve. And... You know, 03, my first vintage there, I love that wine, and, and it got a great score. But then Bob came back, Bob Parker, of course, you know, came back and said, oh, it's even better. I didn't see that. And I, I'm like, well, I always kind of saw it. You, know, so <laughs> you missed it. You know, what was get wrong a, with you, you, Bob? get a palate, dude. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's just funny because – and then the vintages that, they, that people love that you're like, I don't see that at all. And, I, and it's only because, you know, you see what was happening in the vineyard. You hear what people were talking about. And it's like all of a sudden they said 2013 is a big, it's a heavy crop vintage. No, it's not. It's actually everybody's down. Yeah. But someone gets that verbiage out there to the press and they run with it. You know, immediately run the bad. Press. Those are the people that actually have time to answer the telephone. Well, the yeah, I mean, but wine, whites man. were heavy. Whites were very heavy. <laughs> yeah, they but, were. But reds were not. Reds yeah. are light. We're down a third. Yeah, you know, I was down. shocked by that yeah, actually. You know, I was and, as heavy as the whites came in, you started to break for the the rush of the red coming in. You're like, oh, oh, hello. But it's early. It reminds me of 01 and 02 all right. over again. It's early. I mean, it's, you know, we have all of October. It's only October 9th. Is it the 9th today? No, 9th. Yeah, I think yeah, it is. Welcome to Harvest. I yeah. can't remember. Exactly. Day it is. I mean, <laughs> but the reality of it For is. Thursday. This is weird. Yeah, you know? so, yeah, it's Tuesday. We have, we have 20 more days of, of really good hang time yeah. if we needed yeah. to. But we're not. It's early. It's over. So. Um, James, Kimberly, you got any uh, final questions or uh, anecdotal uh, jokes or uh, an expressive dance you'd like to do on camera uh, about your joy of drinking wine before we uh, tune out? Well, I know Jeff is wearing a Boston Red Sox hat, but I also know Bruce Bochy loves Hourglass. So I, are you going to send him a Magnum of 2013 when it's ready? <laughs> you know what? I, I actually thought – so last year I sent him – Only when he wins World Series. Yeah, thank no, you. No, right? no, no, actually, Every so, other year. So, no, so. Yeah, so next year. No, actually I, I'm going to send him some wine. Last year I sent – after they won the World Series, I sent him a, a Magnum. Um, and he called me, and it was a really fun, great little yeah. conversation that we had. He's a really charming guy, and, and for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes we chatted and, and so forth. And, and I thought, i got to send him a bottle this year because he needs it more this year than he did last year. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, Kimberly, we'll take, a, we'll, we'll, we'll take a World Series victory every other year. Yeah, every Thank other you, year. Right? That's fine. Yeah. That, so. And, and here's, here's, my, here's my plan. If the Giants and the Red Sox can hop skip each other every other year, then I'm golden for a while. Let's do that for the 49ers. They're gonna That's be right. Man. <laughs> James, what you got? Uh, I don't know. Any any differences in the harvest, Tony, between Blue Line and uh, and Hourglass that were? It's, great, uh, it's actually a really good question. I mean, I wish you would. In terms of when you pick dinner, um, Hourglass Estate is sort of. Uh, the kid who takes care of himself. 
I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it sounds almost almost comical in the sense that the wine is just it just makes itself. You know, and, and I mean, sorry, Jeff. Again, I told you another reason not to pay me anymore. But um, <laughs> the reality is, um, the our, you know, Blue Line is five different varietals coming in at different times, different clones, different everything. We have one clone, one hillside. It's 22 years old. It's self-regulating at this point. Get it off before the sun, you know, gets to it too much. You know, the colors there, the densities there. You know, that wine's almost ready to go to barrel. Almost all the wines are in barrel right now. So, you know, it's already done. It's already drying up, and the wine is absolutely gorgeous. I mean. I, Again, like I said, Kimberly, you weren't there. You'd love this. Um, you know, Davis, the last class I have to take before you graduate is is the marketing class where every vintage is great. Right. So uh, best ever, man. It's best ever. So so, uh, but really, the 2013 is 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 superlative. It's really really good, and um, I, I'm blown away by the quality. So I really am. It's a great vineyard. I didn't have to do anything. Or blue lines more hard. Uh, that's that's an that's a little understatement. So. But, uh, you know, now blue line is is more complex. There's just more uh, moving, moving parts, parts yeah, to blue line. It's got um, all five Bordeaux varietals. Um, we have four or five clonal selections of Cabernet, um, on and on and on, different soil profiles and so forth. So, and it's newer for us too. I mean, Hourglass Estate is something that a little proprietary has been in the mega blend for, coming for out of while, maybe, so, you know, yeah, it's a couple uh, barrels, best of the best. Yeah, uh, throw all the kids together and see how they're throwing. We're throwing a lot of things against the wall, but you know, the goal and the let, let's make the Merlot, the Cabernet Franc, and the Cabernet the best we can make it, sure. and then we'll look at something else. Right now, yeah. right now is you know our baby. This is, I mean, the Franc is fun, but it's six barrels. The Merlot is a driver for us, but. The Cabernet is really where we really want to drive that Cabernet. Wine to the, next the tannin level. management from a rocky hillside. I mean, this is yeah. a this is well, really it's going to get better because the vines are starting to put some age on it. The, the, yeah. You know, we have the same clone, same rootstock as Hourglass Estate is the backbone now for the Blue Line, yeah. it, and that's the best lot in the cellar this year for yeah. the whole winery. And that's like that they're not afraid to be dry. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's all right, right, guys. On that, uh, I want to thank uh, James and uh, Kimberly for James. joining. Thanks, guys. Uh, Peace out, James. Uh, Johnny, nice as always. Great. Just, thank you. Hold, 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 and this I is for a few months. Guys, hold on a second here. I just, may be old, but I got to see all the cool bands. Hold on a second here. Lawrence <laughs> Welk Rock, Kimberly, I know. You can see no. it. <laughs> I missed the bubble machine, dude. I really do. <laughs> you guys can see a little bit longer with us. Uh, we're going to call off the, uh, the uh, uh, live uh, stream, the live stream. Uh, I want to thank you, and then it's Jeff, gonna get weird. Thanks for having us. This and uh, and Tony and and uh, my good friend uh, Christopher to, for leading the show. Uh, I want to also uh, thanks to uh, 55 Degrees, uh, the storage facility in Saint Helena, uh, sponsoring the uh, the, uh, the evening. All right. Thank you very much, Neil. And Neil uh, uh, Ooh, and Audra and Sky and, and Brian and, and Ken and, and Audra. Thanks, guys. Oh, and and people like you know like participating and in, into tweeting and and they're sending some love by tweet uh, and chat. Thank you very much. Um, next show we having is next Monday uh, with the three incredible winemakers uh, going to a website. Uh, James Hall is going to be there and uh, and uh, Dave Miner and uh, Steve Reynolds. Uh, so it's going to be very fun. Um, until then, uh, good night. Thank you guys. Nice. Appreciate it. Nice. See you guys. Thank you.